this day. It's, um, but what if I told you that in one view of the universe, both suns were not quite there yet? Or neither sun was quite there yet? Depending on how you want to say it. Uh, appearances are deceiving. And motives are a mixed bag. And that was, as so often seems to happen, brought true, brought home for me in a powerful way last night at El Fuego. <laughs> we were out to dinner as, as, as a group, and uh, today is my birthday. There's a song. And there are many songs. Um, so yesterday at lunch, Aaron and Stephanie went out and brought a birthday cake in for me, and that was lovely, and that was <coughs> There's that part of me that doesn't like that center of attention thing, and that's kind of curious because a lot of what I do, I'm the center of attention. But I hadn't really thought about that much. And then uh, at dinner, a certain somebody told them it was my birthday. You finally had that one? He finally confessed. <laughs> my grant him absolution post. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody whistled and people started making other noise and a sombrero landed on my enormous skull where it teetered. <laughs> and I, man, I hate that stuff. <laughs> so I, I started thinking about why I hate that stuff and can do what I do. And I realized that in most of what I do, I can convince myself that I'm not the center of attention, or that it's not about me. After all, if you're doing a wedding, it's about the bride and groom. If you're doing a funeral, it's about the deceased and their survivors. A baptism is about the baby. You can even convince yourself that Sunday is about the message, which doesn't really come from me. It's me using other sources and recombining them and repackaging them and just repeating something. And then I realized, and Erin hates it too. She even hates that I mentioned it. She hates it. <laughs> uh, but, it's on the side. that's right. And that's the issue. Is that if there were times in a person's life when being on the spot wasn't ever a positive thing, being on the spot becomes an uncomfortable thing until you get to that place where you realize that that's what it is and then you can let go of it. We've been meeting for the last three and a half days here. Um, and it's occurred to me that, and it's occurred not for the first time, that people come to such meetings with mixed motivations. Um, and we never know what they are. And that's okay. Because there has to be an unfolding and a revealing and an opening because I think the mixed motivations we bring to any situation are often things that we ourselves are not aware of. That we ourselves need to get in touch with. Did you notice in the interaction between the father and the two sons, the two options that are missing, right? The one son said, nah, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And then went and did it. And the other son said, Yes, I'll do that. And then didn't go into it. Of course, the two options that are missing are, no, I don't want to do that, and not going to do it. And sure, yes, I'll do that, and then going to do it. And I want to say that while we've been trained to understand the son who said, no, I don't want to do that, but what we did, to be the correct choice. Uh, there's a problem, there's, there's a couple problems with that. One is that it assumes that there's only two options, as so much of Western thought does. And the other is that while it's certainly true, that it's better to eventually do the right thing than to not do the right thing. There's more integrity when we say what we mean and mean what we say. 
Now, if the farmer's children were 14, they should have done it. But suppose they were 24, 34. There's more integrity when we say what we mean. And we have the right to say, assuming we're not, you know, four. No. Suppose that the farmer's children had families of their own. Then maybe the most intake, the, the best answer is no, I can't do that, and that's okay. We like to reduce moral <coughs> and ethical choices into neat little packages so that we can have a little checklist, maybe in our back pocket. It has to be in the other pocket. You know, we've got the one pocket where there's a checklist that'll get us into heaven. You know, all the committees we've ever served on, all the little old ladies we've ever helped across the street, we keep a list. So that if it turns out that heaven looks like the mythology tells us it looks and we get to the gate, early gates and St. Peter says no, in the one back pocket is that resume that's going to say, look here, I, I deserve to be here. In the other back pocket, we want to keep a checklist of things that will tell us what to do because it's terribly inconvenient to have to engage the choice. It's much more efficient to whip out the checklist <laughs> And look down a column here and say, Dad, oh, it's fine, okay, this is what I do. But it leads to a really superficial morality, first of all. And it leads to the very strong likelihood that we will encounter situations that aren't on the checklist. And if we haven't developed the skills to make those choices, we're going to be pretty stuck. It's the Pharisee coming to say, who, by whose authority do you say these things? And only having two options in the checklist. And neither of them are going to work out, so they don't know what to do. They freeze. There's a faction in Western culture that wants to reduce everything to the simple. And some things can be reduced to the simple, and that's good to do that. On somebody's birthday, you should bring them Starbucks. <laughs> However, <laughs> and not just talk about it, not just say, I thought about you in line. I thought about you from the bathroom, but I didn't bring you anything from there. <laughs> and so, the people that would like to reduce things to simple binary answers are often quite well intended. The problem is, it's... There's people singing outside. Um, I guess it's not unlike... Um, God, completely derailed my train of thought. Simple binary solutions are, are not unlike giving somebody a tricycle and saying this will be the vehicle that will carry you throughout life. It, it just isn't going to work out. And, and, and in the end, I believe, and, and I believe spiritual teachers are often um, oversimplified in, in the scriptural records of the different traditions as, as being perhaps more simplistic than their actual teachings were. I believe that, that our, our motivations matter and that, especially in the West, we need to learn that saying no is okay. Uh, that saying no is not problematic. But on the other hand, we also need to learn that when our actions are consistent with our motivations and what we say, we're moving closer and closer to that place of awakening, that place we might call uh, union with the divine, that place that might just be the end goal of all spiritual practice.